Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking about his departure, which was about to be accomplished in Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep. But since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was alone. And they kept silent, and in those days told no one of any of the things they had seen. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. Just then a man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son. He is my only child. Suddenly a spirit seizes him, and all at once he shrieks and convulses until he foams at the mouth. It mauls him and will scarcely leave them. I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, you faithless and perverse generation. Must I be, how much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon dashed him to the ground in convulsions. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. The word of the Lord. We're entering upon the season of Lent, that season where we journey with Christ during his last weeks. There's some things about Lent, it becomes very somber. One thing that I do miss during Lent, and we have to save them up, we have to save up our Alleluias. It is neither appropriate to say the Alleluias in the service, nor even to sing music with Alleluias during Lent in some churches. Some churches are a little bit wiggly on that, but that's theologically, that's what we're supposed to do. But I miss them, and I miss them terribly. So anytime you feel motivated today, let's say, Alleluia. Alleluia. Anytime. Winter's almost over. Hallelujah. We survived thus far. Hallelujah. You know, March can be that fickle. Fickle growth. But <coughs> let's hope for the best. And today's snow is just a reminder that we're not in control. So let's, what can we do? And we were fortunate this year because most of the heavy snows either went north of us, east of us, south of us. And the rains, well, the snows in the mountains in the west were incredible. I have a friend there, they had 300 feet of snow in town. 300 feet, that's a lot of snow. Now, I'm from the port. In the port we have seven lakes, seven lakes, and they're mostly on the north side of town. And I happen to live on the north side of town, so I have to drive by the lakes. And usually it's very nice. But with these temperature swings that we have, where we've had 50 or 60 degree temperature changes in the matter of days, it's just been amazing. And we have had, I think, more ice this year than I ever remember having. And we've had more fog in the port than I ever remember having. And it's not just in the morning, although it's usually worse in the morning. It's also bad during the day and it, during the night. But driving in fog at night is horrible. You really lose your orientation. You can't make out those landmarks that you know are there. You think they're there. 
I've been driving for about two minutes on this road and I think that's where the car wash is, but I can't see it. So we're disoriented. And at nighttime especially, there's a muffled sound. I let the dogs out in my backyard. I've got two standard poodles. I let the poodles out in the backyard and they disappear into the fog and I can't see them. And when they bark, it sounds like they're barking and muffling it themselves. There is something unsettling about fog, about losing your orientation, sort of a, a state of confusion. About the only thing we know when we're driving in our car sometimes that at least down is down and up is up. I can't imagine, I can't imagine the prospect of going on a roller coaster in the fog. Can you imagine, I mean, I don't go on roller coasters anyway, but the idea of going upside down and sideways and every other which way in the fog, it's not for me. But Peter, James, and John experienced something like this on the night of the Transfiguration. It wasn't night. Jesus had taken, up, taken them up the mountain, and as Ken talked about, Ken, you told my sermon. <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Took them up the mountain, and there he was transfigured. His face changed. His, his whole body glowed. He was transfigured. You have to read the scripture with your the scripture with their, your imagination fully engaged. Now the disciples, when they saw this, what would your reaction be? You know, your mouth drops open. You can't say anything when your mouth is open. So there was silence. There was a silence of awe. Jesus met Moses and Elijah for a discussion about what was going to happen to him. Now the, three, the thing that these three individuals had in common was that they never died and were buried. Now Moses may have been, but it was in the middle of the Sinai and communications weren't very good and they don't really know that he was actually died. But Elijah, we know, was taken up into heaven in a whirlwind and we of course know Christ. He died but was resurrected. Now Jesus had told his disciples this, what was going to happen to him. It was no big secret. He told them what was going to happen in Jerusalem. But they really had not engaged the notion. As I said, this is at nighttime. They had been awake all day. They were heavy with sleep. How many women have husbands who sometimes fall asleep in front of the television? I saw that look, <laughs> and I saw that one back there too. <laughs> Usually they fall asleep with the remote in their hand. <laughs> My husband did the same thing. What saved our marriage was I invested $6.95 in a second remote. <laughs> he would wake up, oh, after a, a half hour or something, and and pretend that he knew what was going on and he'd say something. And it was totally irrelevant to what was going on because I'd changed channel. Gotcha. But he'd say something because there would be the silence and he wanted to pretend like he knew what was going on all the time. Peter did the same thing. He was probably kind of in that slumber land. He woke up. And he said, oh, oh, this, this is great, this is great. We should preserve this. I know, we'll build houses. We'll build a house for Moses and one for Elijah and Jesus, one for you too. And then Peter, James, and John, we can stay up here and we can serve you. 
and this will be fine. We'll just keep it like this. He really didn't know what he was saying. He was really making decisions that were way over his pay grade. It wasn't to be preserved. It was a part of the plan. Perhaps he thought he could avoid what was going to happen to Jesus in Jerusalem if he, if he just captured this moment, this moment of transfiguration. But the transfiguration was all about what was going to happen. And this happens. How many times, honestly, have you ever blurted out something and as soon as it was out of your mouth, you're sorry that you did? Mm -hmm. If you haven't, well, we'll cast you in perfection and introduce you to Jesus because those are the only two. I think Peter's exhortation was to cover the silence. And we've done that. An awkward silence by interjecting a comment. What's God's reaction to this? Comes down in the clouds, slaps Peter upside the head and says, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Stop your blathering about building houses. Listen to him. It was the kindest kind of a reprimand that God could give. And he tells us this day, listen to him. Just as Peter had made the proclamation eight days earlier, his confession that Jesus was indeed the Messiah, so now God affirms, Jesus is my son. Now many of the lectionary, and it's not uncommon for it to truncate at verse 36, but the rest of the lectionary reading that last little part, when they come down the mountain, that's the action part. What do we do now? What's next? Now the disciples came down the mountain first, and we know that because the father had approached the disciples and said, heal my son. Because Jesus had given them the authority that if you have enough faith, you can do this. Well, they couldn't do it. And so when Jesus came down, the father approached. And he said, your disciples could not heal my son. Would you please heal my son, my only child? Jesus' reaction in these words have to be addressed not to the father, He's talking to his disciples. And he says to them, you faithless and perverse generation, how long must I be with you and bear with you? O oh, ye of little faith. And so Jesus healed the child. And we're left to wonder what's next? Peter really had a very bad sense of timing because if you read on the next story contained within Luke, is that the disciples are arguing now, who is the greatest of them? Jeez, Peter just got slapped the side of the head. He's wondering if he's the greatest of them? I don't think your timing's too good, Peter. We are all Peters, of course. There are so many different sounds of silence. Silences can be very awkward. Remember those first dates? You know you wanted to get, to get, get together with this fellow or this girl. You just needed to get the ball rolling and you didn't know how to do it. It's especially true when two introverts go on the first date. Things get kind of quiet awkward. Our vice president had a very awkward moment when he brought greetings from the president of the United States 
to the European Union. And when he mentioned the president's name, there was dead silence. Vice President Pence is looking down at his script and saying, pause for applause, and there's no applause. Awkward. The Reverend Jan Edmiston, former co-moderator of the General Assembly of our denomination, writes a blog. It's a very good blog. It's called A Church for Starving Artists. And she writes in that that her Sabbath, since she usually works on Sundays, she is the presbyter of Charlotte Presbytery. A new position for her. Her husband the church, serves a church in suburban Chicago, so they have a long distance relationship right now. They should probably have taken a lesson from Toby and Mark. Go to the same place. But anyway, Jan celebrates her Sabbath on Friday. And a few weeks ago, she wrote her blog about her no talking day. That day when she was not going to converse with anybody. It was her Sabbath. She had her errands to run, her things to do. And the only people she spoke to were people that she incidentally encountered in the course of her living that day. So there was a fella that lives in her apartment house who also has a new dog. Well, she had to talk to him. And then there was the pedicurist that she used that day. She had to talk to her. And then there were the servers at the, uh, at the restaurant she ate at. But all told, she figured it was a day without conversation, with only 10 conversations happening. Now, I live alone. I live with two standard poodles and a cat. They don't talk much. I have lots of days where I have no talking days, especially in this winter time. It's probably a good thing that I'm an introvert. But I think sometimes we need that quiet time. We need those no talking days ourselves. When perchance we could listen for God. You might call it prayer. You might call it meditation. It's just listening for God, perhaps a thought, perhaps a fleeting remembrance of something, something God gave you, something God wants you to do, something that you've been arguing with God about. Just call it downtime. Whatever it is, we need that. We need to have a reprieve from those distracting voices so that we can hear the cries of those in need, so that we can hear the pleas of those who are in trouble or in distress. This week, perhaps we traveled the road with our fellow Christians of the Methodist tradition, for we see them this week having to deal with topics that we have been wrestling with and have now at least officially put to rest. And that are the issues of same-sex marriage, the issues of homosexuality, the issues of ordained gay clergy. We made decisions about it. We're continuing to learn to live into it. And the Methodists haven't quite reached that point yet. I'm not going to say anything about the Methodists. I, I wouldn't say anything about Methodists. But we're right. We heard God in a different way than they hear God. Strange. We have to listen to God. We have to be transfigured ourselves by God. And the chief end of the church? Praise and glorify God and enjoy him forever. Good. I will leave you now with a poem. 
poem that was written by a man named Martin Neumuller. It's a different take on silence. First they came. First they came for the socialists. I did not speak out because I'm not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists. And I did not speak out because I'm not a trade unionist. And then they came for the Jews. And I did not speak out because I am not a Jew. And then they came for me. And there was no one left to speak for me. Silence is not always golden. Silence is not always appropriate. The silence of not speaking up in the face of social injustice is not right. God tells us to love our neighbors and to care for our neighbors and to love them just as we love ourselves. Silence isn't always right. We have to have the courage to create that cacophony of protests, to stand up because God expects us to listen to him and God expects us to act upon what we hear from him. Silence is not always golden. Silence can be a malignancy. So know when to speak and know when not to speak. In the name of the one who created us and the one who sustains us, the one who redeems us, one God, amen. Okay.